My guest is a filmmaker and a storyteller. His own story is in many ways reminiscent of my own. He's the founder of Let's Care, where he interviews underrepresented and underestimated change makers, and he's produced a video series called 20s and Change, San Francisco. His name is Matt Scott. Matt, how you doing? I'm great. I'm happy to be here with you. And as you mentioned, there's a lot that we have in common. So um, it's always good, I think, especially in the grief journey to meet people who you could relate to, um, even in unexpected ways. And so I'm just happy to be here. I was telling Matt off the air, there's like three things similar between your story and my story. And then as we started talking, he said, oh, by the way, I found you through Fightful.com, <laughs> which, is a, which is another site that I own. And it turns out he knows everybody involved with that site, too. And I thought, man, it's, it really is a small world. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, it's cool because for me, I mean, it was maybe two months ago that I actually filled out the Grappling with Grief form, all because – because of this new podcast I'm doing, which I'll mention, Wrestling Rehap Ups, I am, you know, starting to get more into wrestling. I first became a fan like 20 years ago. But I think Sean had the tweet about his interview pinned. It might still be there. And that's how I heard of this. And and wow. grief just takes up so much of uh, my my time and energy and writing. So it's cool to to find that random connection and to be here, even though I, I literally, I don't, do not know Sean personally. Yeah. Um, he's kind of connected us. He has. Awesome. Well, your story starts in 2017 uh, yeah. with the loss of your dad. His name was Moses. Can you mind, do you mind talking about your dad and, and do you mind talking about what happened to him? Yeah. My dad is, uh, what, he was really my best friend just to start there. And I'm sure a lot of people could relate to that. Um, or you're really lucky if you could relate to that, right? And my dad was really my best friend. It's someone who I always would go to for um, not even advice, but just support. Like I think of my mom and my dad and this dynamic between them. My dad, um, especially in the last 20 years of his life, he he had a home health care business where he was focused on uh, just providing care and taking care of elderly people as they kind of entered their dying years. And my dad's personality was always more like, I believe in you. I support you. And this is a big, strong six foot one, six foot two, depending on what day you asked him, <laughs> uh, man who would like go to the gym and big and strong, but also uh, like really kind hearted and um, selfless in so many ways. Whereas my mom, definitely more advice oriented. And so I always felt like I would go to my dad just for the support and the belief and the pep talks and um, he was a big fan of the Rocky movies and stuff like that of that generation. So you can imagine someone who's who's definitely macho and old school in a way, but also uh, just kind of like the, a really nice guy. And um, I still appreciate that. I'm glad that like I kind of took on some of that. But um, my dad, he grew up in Prince Edward County, Virginia, in the civil rights era in a time when the schools were closed um, in 1959, all because of um, something called massive resistance or mass resistance. Uh, long story short, it all tied in with just like the racial tension at the time. Um, and, you know, him as a young black man who was in high school, kind of had to navigate that experience. Um, and so he moved away from home to go live with, with you know, I think at first he lived with like um, uh, Quakers or the American Friends Service, which is in the community I know a ton about, but definitely uh, a community he was not part of at the time. Lives with Holocaust survivors too to finish high school. And then, you know, he just had his life kind of uh, take shape after that, after he graduated, um, going to college, serving in the military, um, eventually, you, decades and years later, uh, having a family. And that's kind of how, how I ended up here. So that's a little bit about my dad and his story. And, and do you mind talking about what happened to him? Yeah, yeah. So, so he was, a, I mentioned, a really healthy person and definitely prided himself on going to the gym. And he was also running his business. So very active um, from... I'd say 2004 when he started his business, especially through even um, his death. But uh, the thing that that uh, I noticed in our stories that relates is that my dad, maybe January of 2017, um, just all of a sudden became sick, and he was he was getting out of it, and and things were just off. He didn't have much of an appetite, and so my my 
mom and my oldest sister really like, forced him to check himself into the hospital. And little did we know about a month and a week later, he, he passed away. And what they ultimately found was it was due to a rare form of leukemia that sort of seemingly came out of nowhere and just hit. Um, but yeah, it, it was all really sudden um, with him. And I think the thing that's so interesting is that like at the time too, I was really pushing him like, hey, you should capture your story. You should write a book. You should do something to document, you know, your journey because, you know, one day like we won't have that. And then, you know, he was gone just like that March 7th, 2017 or March 8th, 2017. So um, it was, you know, that was, that was it. It all happened so fast. And th- and it's funny you mentioned that because that was a catalyst for me producing a documentary about my parents Yeah, was because I wanted them to get their story out before my dad was gone. And, and I wanted him to be able to talk about his own life while he still could. Yeah. So, uh, so I can relate to, uh, to you, to what you're saying on that too. Now, after your dad's passing, you joined a grief group and you sent me an email um, uh, that led to us talking today. Here's a quote from your email. You said, the time I gave myself to grieve in community was sacred and necessary. You mind talking about that? Yeah. So I, you know, it's kind of surreal to think about just because in January of that year again the very end of January 2017 is when my dad was sick so um you know there wasn't a lot of time to process things or to plan but I do remember around mid-February when I just saw things going downhill with his health where you know he he was very present and responsive before but he was definitely you know out of it when he was in the hospital and I remember thinking like I don't think he's going to make it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I just don't think he's going to make it. And I think part of that was because uh, when he was in the hospital, when I first visited him at the end of January, you know, kind of going in and out of being present, he said to me, um, it's so jarring, like not even like him, but like, don't get your hopes up was something that came out of his mouth. Um, and I was like, what? And, he, and I asked him what he said. And he was like, oh, nothing. Because I think it just came out of his head. Um, but so by February, I was thinking I might need a grief group. And I reached out and I um, I eventually, by the end of March, that same month, I was in a group. And that was so important because we all have so much going on. Like I was still working slash trying to work and struggling with that. And, and um, I needed space to be able to be with other people and just hear their experiences when it comes to grief. Uh, because honestly, like while this isn't the cure to grief, if there, th- I don't think there's a cure, but um, it was something that comforted me at the time that I was surrounded by people who I was comparing myself and saying like, well, I didn't lose my, you know, my dad to a drug overdose or I didn't lose my dad like immediately because of a heart attack or, you know, there were all of these rationalizations that kind of happened because of the stories I heard. And I, I sort of learned over time, like grief isn't meant to be compared. It's your own experience. Right. And that's that's important. It's important to spend time with what you have. But it helped me to kind of keep perspective that my life wasn't like wasn't broken or horrible. Um, because I was with other people. And then at the same time, I also received so much like advice and love from people along the way who had my back. So I I never really truly felt alone in the grief experience, which I don't think, you know, a lot of people, especially people who don't join groups or talk with people like we're doing here, um, could relate to. Yeah, I think sometimes people are afraid to reach out to other people. I think they're afraid. They think that they're alone and they think no one can relate to their story, even though they can. And for me, that was one of the reasons why I created GWG was because I wanted to tell people stories so that I could show other people that people can relate to what they're dealing with and that there's Mm -hmm. a light at the end of the tunnel. And this kind of takes me to another thing we have in common. All right. uh, And that is that, you know, I lost my father just as you lost your father. Uh, One of the outlets that I created to tell people stories was GWG. You created Let's Care, yeah, uh, which is similar in, in some ways. Tell me about Let's Care. Yeah, I so I actually started Let's Care. I launched it on um, technically before my dad actually passed away in a different incarnation. So 
what happened is I decided to, to create a blog. I, I work in the social change world as a social impact storyteller, which basically means that I'm doing a lot of communications around social impact and trying to amplify people's voices and working to do that. And so I was already doing that for full-time work with like NASA and the United Nations and other groups, which was really cool. But I saw a gap where like I you know, especially as like a young black man, like I was the only one of me in so many of these rooms. And so I thought like, how could I just shine light on more people who I could relate with? Like whether it's young people, what, you know, whatever that might be. And so I started writing about people at first, you know, I wasn't super committed to it, but I, I did it. And when my dad died, it kind of hit me that like one, like, it is really draining to do anything after you experience a loss oftentimes, but like writing about people's stories wasn't for me. I also wasn't interviewing them like, like you're doing now or like I do now. Um, and I kind of realized like in losing my dad, he was this awesome like change maker, this awesome hero in my life. And like to actually talk to people and interview them, not only was like conducive for me as a griever and kind of therapeutic, honestly, but it was like this way for me to have these, like meet other people who kind of reminded me of my dad in different ways, whether it's like the positive impact they're making in the world or whether it's the fact that they also experienced grief and still are continuing on. Like I brought up my loss so many times, especially in my early interviews and still um, do now because that's what motivated the journey. And it's cool to kind of bring yourself to the table, you know, when it comes to like creating a project, like you're doing graph, like GWG is here and you're able to talk about your story. And like, for me, that's what Let's Care was about where, you know, whenever I, whenever I had the opportunity when I started and still like I'll mention how my dad motivates me um, and those human conversations. So we definitely have, have that in common. And I think there's something to that about just like when you're in this really kind of dark hurt place, like reaching out and connecting with people who could somehow relate to where you are on the journey is, is again, something that's healing kind of like a grief group, except in, in my humble opinion, and hopefully there's like a much cooler way to, uh, to, to connect with people. Yeah, for sure. And, and much like what you're talking about, I reference my experiences all the time when I talk to yeah. people. Because I don't want people to feel like they're under the microscope and, and talking about things that I can't relate to when I can. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it puts them at ease and it makes them open up a little bit more. So yeah. uh, so I'm with you on that. Now, not to be undone in terms of things that we both have in common, we're both <laughs> filmmakers. Yeah. And, and as I mentioned, I produced a documentary about my parents. Uh, in your case, you produced a video and series inspired by your dad. It's called 20s and Change San Francisco. Yeah. Tell me about that series. I saw that you have a, a trailer on YouTube for the first episode, I believe. Tell me about that. Yeah, so I have the I have the trailer up, and then I also have a preview that's like day zero of what was a, a six-day journey. Uh, so June 2019, I was in San Francisco during the last week of the uh, of of the month, and I interviewed 21 change makers over six days on like what was actually just a week off from my full time job. Um, because, you know, with grief, like you sometimes have this yearning to just create something. And for me, it was like this yearning to actually go out. And sure, I was interviewing people, but I really wanted to truly go out and like explore um, not even the San Francisco Bay Area. Like I think it could have been any city, even though I love that city. Um, but just like go out and have conversations with people and bond with them. And it's it wasn't like anything I'd ever done before. Um, it was brand new for me. And like the the motivator there was losing my dad because that's what you know what's driven Let's Care this whole time. But I think that the thing that's so interesting about like making that film is I filmed it in, in June, 2019. And along the way, it's been so um, notable, like just to see how much grief has either you know, motivated me or more often than not kind of been the thing that's like, okay, I'm, I'm still grieving my dad, but also trying to create something. And it's tough to create when you're grieving. Um, and, uh, 
And so that that was kind of where things started. Now I'm actually getting ready to release the full film with a private virtual screening. Like anyone could sign up for it on the Let's Care website at let's.care slash film. But like I'm hosting a private screening on March 7th, 2021. Um, again, because that's the day before I lost my dad or that's the day before the anniversary um, as a way of celebrating him and just recognizing like I wouldn't have done any of this with Let's Care in terms of interviewing people and learning people's stories and caring this much because honestly I've started so many projects that I just dropped because like one thing or the other came up and this is the first thing that I, I really held on to but I'm yeah I'm about to release it um, just in line with the anniversary and it's kind of surreal to think that like it's only been four years since I since I lost him but um, I love to do something to honor my dad every anniversary especially and and this film is it that's very very nice yeah I I, I did a limited release of, of my film on the second yeah. anniversary of my dad's passing mm. so uh, I'm in line with you too we're, we're like brothers that don't look like brothers yeah you know exactly I mean who knows <laughs> yeah I mean that, look if we if we start standing side by side more hanging out or something I think people <laughs> might pick up on that yeah <laughs> Well, I want to ask you about this. You wrote an article for thriveglobal.com. Yeah. Uh, and this is a comment you made that I thought was interesting. You said, as tough as they are to digest, I don't know where I'd be without the digital breadcrumbs. Yeah. Now, I can relate to this, too, because when my sister passed, I held on to the WhatsApp conversations uh, and I backed up the WhatsApp conversations. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I just found out recently that her phone number has been transferred to somebody else. But I still have those conversations because it's I can look back on all the things we had talked about over the last few years. Tell me about that comment about uh, you don't know where you'd yeah. be without the digital breadcrumbs. Yeah. So, I mean, I, like like most people, you have the voicemails and different messages and texts and all of that, which is great. Um, emails, great. And, and I think anything you could hold on to is something you should definitely hold on to and save and back up in a million places if you can. But for me, the thing that um, that was the, the valuable digital breadcrumb was a 40 minute interview that I did with my dad. I honestly don't even know what motivated it. Um, it was October 2015. And I was sitting down with my dad at home. I live in Washington, DC. My dad um, and my family are in New Jersey where I grew up. So I was visiting for a weekend and this was part of my push to, I think, to tell my dad, you need to capture your story. And I just decided to interview him and I'd never really interviewed anyone before. And so I just sat down with him, hit like record on the garage band uh, app. So the audio is kind of all over the place because I didn't have like the fancy mic and all that stuff at the po at that point. And I just like asked him about his life. And, you know, it's it's crazy because what we got out of that was like, was what I thought would be the first chapter of a book for him. And I never went back to record more. And then, you know, time gets away from you. I would never have known that a year, a year and a half later, he would be gone. Right. But um, we recorded that and. I, it was so special to me and it's been so special to me every time I've been able to go back to it to just listen and hear his voice and hear our, our dynamic and interaction. And so because of that, I'm someone who now, like if you're thinking of interviewing your parents, your family members, whoever, do it. I mean, part of what motivated Let's Care, I'm sure, was just this idea that like my dad's gone. I can't interview him now. I can't record more for him now. I can't capture more of those like insights and things from him now. Um, but I want to be someone who captures those breadcrumbs and leaves something for um, for like if I have kids one day for my kids or even for my nephew, for my family members when I'm not here, whenever that is. Um, and so I that you know I, I was lucky to have that conversation and I'm I kind of feel like I'm an ambassador of like go out there record whatever you can take all the pictures and videos and all that because one day you'll really appreciate that you have those um, because you won't always have the chance to take them. Hundred percent right. When I when I decided to do the film, I know my family thought I was crazy. Yeah. And you know I I went the full you know the extra mile I guess I hired a film studio and everything but. They thought I was crazy, but once my dad passed, they were grateful for that footage. Yeah. So, so you're right now. The footage that you filmed, are you going to be able to incorporate that into your series? 
No, so it was it was just audio with my dad. Okay. But it's funny because we have there, you know, there are other clips. I'm unfortunately, and that's that's the piece. Like I don't have like a video interview with my dad or something like that, but I wish I did, right? And and I I think the gift of that at least not having all of those extra elements that I wish I had, like, you know, I I'm able to point out to people like hell yeah, you want to record like with your mom or whoever you still have in your life, your your family, whatever it is. And so actually, like coincidentally, I am, you know, just in the coming month or so, finally interviewing my mom, kind of getting uh, getting up that nerve to do that. But um, I yeah, I, I can't stress enough for people how much like we need to to realize we won't always have have each other. We won't always have the people we love. So, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't position it to that. Like my, uh, with my mom when I told her that I was going to interview <laughs> yeah, her, yeah, but yeah. that's in, you know, that's in there. Definitely. Awesome. Well, 2020 was a difficult year for most of us yeah. on some level. Uh, yeah. and in the email that you wrote to me, I'm going to read this, uh, this line you said yeah. on top of the pandemic as a young black queer man, this year yeah. threw a lot at me. It was exhausting to say the least. Yeah. Now, I don't like to talk politics uh, on podcasts, uh, but the United States in 2020 was very divisive. Yeah. Uh, More so than it had been in decades. Uh, A lot of issues of racism came to light. Personally, I think they've always been there, but they came to light now because of of cell phones and because of social media. Uh, Police brutality came to light. I'm not going to pretend that I can relate to any of that because I know I'm privileged as a white man. I know I am. Yeah. Tell me for you, can you sum up how 2020 was for you, given everything that went on, and yeah. how happy are you that 2020 is in the rear view now? <laughs> oh, well, that's a big question. So I think like one thing to start to say is like we all have different uh, forms of privilege in different ways, or a lot of us do. Like I have like forms of privilege, like my parents just being really well, um, you know, educated and being supportive and in my life and being, you know, having a college degree. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot that I have. So for me, 2020 was a tough year from, I would say from a mental health standpoint and from the standpoint of like being someone who for years, even, um, you know, because it's almost been four years since I lost my dad, but for years I've always had that grief as part of my, how I see the world and my experience. And one of the things that was toughest to tie it in with what you're doing with GWG is like, I was, I I really wasn't truly able to grieve as much as I would normally, or even think about my grief or my dad as much as I would normally, because I was in this zone of like, okay, we have this isolation. And now I'm finding myself like, uh, like right after the police murders and everything you reference, just a lot of people reaching out and asking questions. And there's a lot of tension going on around that, which just, there's a heightened state of anxiety with all of it. And so uh, between that and the election and everything else, regardless of your politics, like I think everyone was just kind of having like, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, but like a, a shitty time with, with everything. I'm assuming I'm allowed to curse. You could say whatever uh, you want. I'll drop, I drop yeah. it in 30 minutes in, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was rough. But at the same time for me, like I, I felt like I was able to like one, like progress in terms of my career, which is always awesome. And, and that's great. But it, yeah, it was, it, it was a struggle just to deal with how much of a spotlight there was on identity. Now, going into 2021, I think the thing that's interesting is I feel a lot more prepared for those conversations and to dive into those um, through Let's Care. Like one of my things is making sure we're talking about identity because it to me, it's not even like politics. Like I, I, I know what you mean, because uh, like identities and different groups get tied to different political groups, which is just like. It happens and and um, it's kind of frustrating, but I want more people to like talk about who we are and where we come from so we better understand each other. And that's what 20s and Change is about. So like as I hired an editor to like start to finish the film for me and worked with her on on that, it kind of reminded me like, oh, in 20s and Change San Francisco, we had these deep conversations that the world needs to have now. And so now I'm kind of excited to put them out there to show like a, a model of 
how to have important conversations without like choking and killing each other because we disagree <laughs> or because like because um, it's uncomfortable. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm 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 definitely hoping for for a better year this year. Uh, and I don't want to go off on a, on a tangent, but yeah, I definitely yeah. think that social media needs to be better regulated. I think a lot of what we saw last year was because of social media groups. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we'll see what happens, but I feel like the climate is already improving. Maybe now I'm Canadian. So yeah. maybe kind of on the outside looking in, that's my, my, my finger on the pulse. That's not quite accurate. I don't know, but no. it feels like things are slowly yeah. starting to improve a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think, uh, you know what, it's, it's hard to tell. I really, I mean, I'm someone who's optimistic and hopeful about things as opposed to kind of thinking that the worst will happen. And, and I'll say I am because like, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm able to, to make an impact. I saw my dad making an impact every day with his work, especially in home health care and, and, you know, um, just visiting with older people. So I know what we're capable of when we commit ourselves to things. Now, I think a lot more people need to commit themselves to actually making a difference and, and I think the, the biggest thing I'm seeing is that, you know, we're not, it's not perfect, but like more people are willing to have the conversation. And like when it comes to it all, it's funny because it all ties back to grief for me where like people, I'm sure you experienced this where you're talking about grief and others might not know what to say. They might not want to have the conversation and dive in. And I, the same goes for race and like sexual orientation and like religion and all and politics. Even people don't want to talk about it, mm -hmm. uh, which I think in part is a real like Western, like U.S. way of thinking, because a lot of different cultures, they'll just dive into like sex, money, religion, politics, whatever. They'll do it. And they'll they're more comfortable with fighting and confrontation. They're they're just different. And I'm not saying that it's better because I think we have so much awesome stuff happening uh, here in our slice of the world. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, man, like we're, we're getting, we're getting there slowly. Um, and, you know, we can never underestimate how much like each person's effort, each conversation, each uh, comment and thing we say might actually contribute to, to building a better world. So I'm going to get off my soapbox with that. But <laughs> I think about that. I think about that a lot um, because of let's care and just the social impact work that I do overall. Well, you've written that through everything. You have yet to lose yeah. your smile. Mm. And uh, so I hope that never changes. For more information on Let's Care, you can go to www.let's.care and you can see the trailer for 20s and Change San Francisco on YouTube. Uh, we'll post the link on uh, grapgrief.com as well as on our YouTube channel. Once again, I've been talking to Matt Scott. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been good to be here. Mm.